So we'll recap a little bit on protocol architectures and answer some questions about what's the difference between TCP and IP. Uh, when we go through the example of TCP IP operation. But first, where we finished last week was with a little bit about addressing. That is, if we want to communicate with other devices and other applications, they need addresses. Because if I want to send something to someone, the network needs to de deliver it to the correct destination. So, to recap on the types of addresses that we saw, each device attached to a network we say has a network interface, one or more network interfaces. My laptop has at least three network interfaces, Bluetooth, wireless LAN and the wired Ethernet port. Each network interface connects us to a, normally a local area network or a wide area network. Let's say that, that directly the network that we're directly attached to. And that technology on the LAN or wide area network uses a specific type of addressing scheme to communicate only on that network. And the address that my network interface has for communications on that network is referred to as a hardware address, sometimes a, a MAC address or a physical address. It's used for communications just to devices within the same network, the same physical network. So if I connect my laptop via a cable direct to here, both devices, so there are two network interfaces, one on my laptop, one on this computer, both will use the same addressing scheme, but of course they'll have different addresses. You should have unique addresses if you want to communicate with two different devices. That would be the hardware address. But the internet is made up of many different LANs and wide area networks, all connected together. And they all use different technologies and may use different addressing schemes. So to be able to communicate between my laptop using wireless LAN and some web server using some completely different technology in the US, we introduce a new type of address, a logical or a network address, or specifically an IP address, which is given to devices so that they can communicate across an internet. Every device on the internet has an IP address, so then if I want to send to the server in the US, I will send to its IP address without knowing what LAN technology it's using. So the result, in most cases, each network interface has two addresses, the hardware address and the IP address. So that's for communicating between computers. So if I want to send to the Facebook web server, really I need to know its IP address. If I know its IP address, I'll use the internet protocols, IP, to send some data to the Facebook web server or the computer that is operating as the Facebook web server. But we need something more because on computers we can have many applications running at the same time. My laptop can have a web browser running which is communicating with web servers around the world. It can have an email client running which is communicating with email servers at the same time and an instant messaging client and Skype four different applications. So when I send and receive data, we need some other type of address to identify when data comes to my computer, it comes to my IP address, which of those four applications should my operating system send it to? Does the data go to my web browser, my Skype client, or my instant messaging client? So we in fact have addresses for applications and we use what's called port numbers. A transport address is a more general name but more specifically a port number which is a number which is used to identify an application on your computer. The last type of address we can say is that we also have some addressing 
schemes which are specific to different types of applications and addresses which are made friendly to us humans. Our computers can communicate using IP addresses but for me to remember the IP address of the Facebook computer may be hard and therefore there's this user-friendly type of address, a domain name. All I need to remember is www.facebook.com and then there's another system that will find the corresponding IP address of the Facebook web server. So we can say the IP address is the address used by the computers to communicate. The domain name is something used by us humans to make it easier to remember addresses. And there is in fact a way to map between a domain name and an IP address. Let's have a, a look at some more examples. We saw this last week where an interface, we can look at the configuration of that interface. Here I'm looking at the configuration of my wireless LAN interface because I'm currently using that and it shows me the hardware address of my interface and my IP address here. So that are the addresses assigned to my interface at the moment. If I access some website click on a link to our course website so my browser has just accessed a web server we can look at some of our recent communications using looking at some network statistics netstat is a program that looks at statistics or recent communications. The things it shows us are it lists the recent communications from my computer and it shows here that my computer 10103239 here's my IP address has communicated with some foreign address 203131209982 so that's the IP address of the computer I communicated with. And this indicates the port number used by the applications in that communication. So an application on my computer, the web browser, had port number 48585. It has no specific meaning, this number. It's, it's chosen by the operating system. It communicated with an application on this computer using port number 80. And you may have seen this port number before it's the common port number used by a web server. This is a port number. After the colon here is a port number. So IP address is just the format which this program presents it. IP address, port number. IP address, port number. So the network topology looks like this. There's my computer, the laptop. We know its IP address of its interface, its network interface, its connection to a network. We don't know what's inside the network. We don't, from this information, we don't know whether there's a direct link between the two computers or this computer's on the other side of the world. It's just some network. This is the IP address of the other computer. 
And on my laptop, I was running an application, the web browser. And that was using port 48585. And of course, I may have been running other applications at the same time. They would be assigned different port numbers. And this application communicated with an application on this computer using port 80. And the port number 80 is the default port number used by web servers. So the port number is used to identify when I sent the data, I would set, my computer would set the destination IP address as 203.131.209.82. So the data would be delivered to this computer and the destination port number would be 80. So the data would be delivered to this application on this computer. And that would send back a response. One last program or example. <coughs> we said that, okay, computers use IP addresses to communicate, but us humans use, often remember, domain names. There's some system that maps this human friendly domain name to its corresponding IP address. NS lookup gives us some information about what is the IP address <coughs> for this domain name, ICT. And it tells us the answer here. The IP address for this domain name is 203.131.209.82, which is the IP address that we connected to here. Because what I did beforehand was, in my browser, I visited the course website, ICT, so on, which the domain name system took this as an input, found the corresponding IP address, and then my computer sent data to that IP address, and eventually to that application. Because of my web browser sent the data, it knew to send to port 80, because a web browser communicates with a web server, and a web server, by default, will use port 80 as its port number. Uh, again, this is just saying, so this is a lookup where my computer asks some other computer, what is the IP address for this domain name? This is the computer that it asked. That is, my computer sent a special message to 10.10.10.9 saying, what is the IP address for this domain name? And it in fact sent a 10.10.10.9 port number 53. That's the port number used by that application to tell me what is the IP address for this domain name. Yes, so this is a DNS server. The system is called the domain name system. So port number 53 is commonly used by different types of servers, not web servers, but these special DNS servers which tell us an IP address given a domain name. We're going, to foc we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail when we get to the end of the course and look at applications. But that, that's a short introduction. Any other questions on this before we move off addresses? <coughs> yes. Yeah, this is the IP address for the, this computer. Yeah, this is the IP address of another, what we call DNS server, a domain name system server. That is a special server that its, its goal is to answer these requests. What is the IP address for this domain name? It just keeps a table, really, of domain name, IP address. You send a request, what is the IP address of this domain name? It sends back the IP address. Yep. Uh, when we use the browser and then sometimes we encounter the other, like the DNS server, the has failed, 
Yes, so sometimes you may see an error. You, you open your browser, you type in www.facebook.com and press enter. Well, what actually has to happen is that your browser, before contacting the Facebook web server, needs to find the IP address of that Facebook web server. So what it does... Yep. Okay, I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, so let's try and explain it with an illustration. There's another computer here. And that's acting as our DNS server. We don't care where it is at the moment. It's on our network. It has an IP address, 10, 10, 10, 9, in our example. So think of server as the name of the DNS server. This is the address. It just turns out that the name and the IP address are the same, to keep things simple. This is the actual address. This is the name of that server. So what happens, I open my browser, type in, in our case, ict.sit, press enter. My browser, and my operating system may help it, needs to find out what is the IP address of ICT. So it sends a message to the DNS server to 10.10.10.9 saying what is the IP address of ICT? The DNS server will respond. The IP address of ICT is 203. Dot dot whatever. And then it will send a request to 203.131 saying I want to download this web page. And this would send back the web page. So sometimes in your browser you may see an error or there's a long delay. It may be because there's a, it takes time to get a response from the DNS server. That's perhaps a little bit too much detail for what we want to show. The, the, the server field here could be a different name. So there's a, a system of DNS servers throughout the world. Most organizations may have their own DNS server. SIT has one. In fact, we have two. One of them inside SIT has the address 10.10.10.9. So that whenever a computer in SIT needs to know an IP address of a domain name, it sends a request to this individual server. So this server keeps a mapping or a list of mappings between domain names and IP addresses. It's more complex because if we send a request for what is the IP address for www.google.com, this may not know the answer, in which case it may send to another DNS server, maybe the DNS server for TU. And maybe that doesn't know the answer, so it would send to another DNS server, maybe the DNS server for Google, which should know the answer. Response will come back, and then we'll know what the IP address is. So there's a whole system and a hierarchy of DNS servers, but we're not covering that today. Uh, it could be a problem. So if you're using some, some other application, you, it must do the same thing. You're using MSN, using any application that takes a domain name as an input, and MSN does, then it will use DNS to find the corresponding IP address. If, for example, the DNS server is not working, then you will not get a response and you will not be able to contact the destination server, or if there's some delay in the communications, or it doesn't know the domain name, then yeah, we could get an error. So if we, if we, if the DNS not work, we can contact by putting the IP number instead. Yeah, 
Yes. You don't need the domain name. If you want, you can forget about domain names for the rest of your life and just remember IP addresses. And you'll save time because if you type in the IP address in your browser, instead of ICT.SIT, I type in 203.131, then my browser sends the data directly to the server. It doesn't send a request to the DNS server. That makes it slightly faster for your browsing, but harder because it's harder to remember IP addresses. Let's, let's move on. We'll, cover, we'll see more examples of addresses throughout the course. And you can look at some of those, you can look at your own computer and see examples. This the command ifconfig under Windows, the similar one is ipconfig, but it does about the same thing if you run a command prompt in Windows. NSLOOKUP I just used at netstat. You can run them on your own computer and see your own addresses. So on the command line in Windows, if you start a command prompt, I don't know how you do it in Windows 7, I guess, the same as the old ones, type in CMD, run, or a command prompt, and it opens up that black screen and you can type in commands. There are other ways as well, graphical ways as well. Let's go through an example of how TCP IP protocol stack, how the layers transmit data between two computers. Uh, first, just a listing of some example protocol names. So in the layers, we may have multiple protocols that implement the desired functionality. This is showing, this is really the network layer, which is about getting data across the internet the primary protocol used is IP, the internet protocol. It's quite simple, although it specifies as the formats of addresses. So what does this structure mean? That's part of IP, the IP address. But the protocol itself is quite simple. You take some data, put it in an IP datagram, send it to the next device in the network, which is a router. That will take it, send it to the next one, until it reaches the destination computer. There are some other protocols that help IP in performing its functionality, like finding the best path through the internet. There are many paths to reach the Facebook web server in the US. What is the best path? Well, we can use different protocols to do that, a routing protocol. This layer is the transport layer. Two main protocols, TCP, and UDP. There are several others, but not as widely used. And they are dealing with getting data between applications on the end computers. TCP especially deals with getting data in a reliable manner between applications. If my application needs to transfer a file, TCP does all the work of, okay, maybe we have a large file. Instead of sending that all in one message, break it into smaller chunks. Send one chunk. If it gets to the destination, that destination would send back an acknowledgement saying, thank you, send the next chunk. It will send the next part. If it doesn't get the acknowledgement back, it may retransmit. And there are many complexities of how TCP provides reliability for that data transfer. That's the role of TCP. And then above that, our application layer protocols. Some, you know, FTP for file transfer, web browsing, email, remote logins, network management, and hundreds of others, or, or many more application layer protocols. And below that are the data link layer and physical layer. Not shown on this diagram, but we can imagine that the data link layer and physical layer, which are normally specific to different technologies. Ethernet, 
where you plug the LAN cable into your computer, has its own data link layer and physical layer. A different wide area network technology may have a different data link layer and physical layer. Let's go through an example of web browsing and look at what happens, how the data passes through the different layers to communicate. The basic way web browsing works is that you have your computer, a destination computer. On your computer you run the web browser application. On the destination computer there's a web server application running. So it's just a piece of software running on the other computer, the server computer. And you type in a domain or you click on a link in your web browser. Your web browser creates a request message and the, the format of that message is really a request for some URL or for some page. And it's, we say it's a get message. We want to get this page. We send that request message to the web server. When the web server receives it, it checks on its hard disk in this slash or in this directory test. Is there the file index.html? If it exists, and everything's okay, then the web server will take this page, read it in, and put the contents of this file inside a response. The response will have some status information at the start, like some headers, saying this is the protocol we're using, this is the version we're using, everything's okay, and then include the contents of the file that was requested comes back to your browser, your browser takes the contents, displays it on your screen. You click on another link, the same thing happens and so on. That's the basic operation of web browsing. Again, at the end of the course, we'll have a topic on how web browsing works in detail, but that's, that's all we need for today. Let's look at an example and then look at the data, the packets that are actually sent across the network. Can you hear me up the back? Okay. Let me know if it's a problem. The example is I'm going to access a website and I'm going to record from my computer, I'm going to record what happens in terms of my computer sending data out. So before I access the website in a moment, first I'm going to start my computer to record, to make a, a measurement of everything that my computer sends and receives. And then we'll look at that data and see what we've sent and received. I need to remember how to do it. So I'm going to start a program that will record data on my computer. TCP dump is the name of the program. It's just going to take a capture of all the TCP packets that my computer sends and receives from my wireless LAN interface and it's going to write them to some file and I only want to record packets going to and from port 80. I know that web browsers are going to access a web server on port 80 so I'm telling this program, just record the packets that my computer sends and receives between port 80 and itself. It's running, it's recording everything now. It does nothing interesting there. It's just recording. So now I'll, I will access a web page. And the URL is just a, a server slash test slash index dot html. Let's hope. Okay, so it's received the web page, so it's finished. You may have noticed quickly there it said looking up sandylands.info. That was DNS working. When I pressed enter, 
my browser first sent a request to the DNS server saying, Who has the, what is the IP address of sandylens.info? Sent back, and then I sent the request to this web server, not this one, to some other one, and received the file back. There's the file. Look at the source of that file. Okay, it's just some HTML. I think you've learned or you're learning writing HTML in some other course. You'll understand that. Let's look at what was captured. We can stop this program, stop it from recording the packets which were sent and received, and now look at them. That is, open this file web.cap. open web.cap, just a capture, and the program, all right. The program that I'm using to look at them is called Wireshark. You'll get to use this in more detail in the lab next semester. You can use it in your own time this semester. We'll just use it for some demonstrations. What it does, all the data or all the packets that my computer sent and received that were captured by that TCP dump program are displayed in a list here with some details about them. I only want to look at some. I only want to look at a selection of the web browsing data. There are many packets here, only some are of interest to us. So I'll try and find them. Bear with me, and then we'll explain what we see. Maybe. If I can find my address. Here's, here we go. I'll just highlight one packet that my computer has sent. Just looking at this row, this is just a number of packet in all the ones we recorded. The time from when I started that TCP dump program, 24 seconds after I started it. The source IP address, that is the IP address of my laptop. The destination IP address, which I could show you is the IP address of the server that I accessed. Some computer on the internet with IP address 125. So this is just saying that my computer has sent a packet to this other computer, 12525292919. And the summary of that packet, it was a GET request, like we expected. The web browser running on my computer sends to the web server running on this computer a request for this test slash index.html page. And the next packet, is the response coming from the server, 125, to my laptop. And it, this is just a summary of what's included inside the data of that packet, is some OK message saying, your request was OK and here's the re response. This top portion shows a list of packets when we select a packet here, we can see the details of that. So let's see that here. I'm selecting the packet that's come from the server to my laptop. I requested a web page, the server should send back a web page. We can expand. Here it is. 
this is the data which was sent from the server to my laptop. As we saw, the web page which was displayed on my browser was simply this HTML. So we have actually captured all of the data that was received by my laptop by this other program. This program just allows us to look at some of the details of what happened. It's structured so that this is the data for the HTTP message. Let's draw that. The data in our case is some HTML, this set of lines here. That's the information we want to communicate from our application on the server to my application on my laptop. That data is encapsulated in what we say is a HTTP header. This is information that is sent with the data that is used by HTTP to communicate between server and browser some extra information like a status message saying your request was okay, here's the response, the date of the response, the software that was the server, and some other information that's useful for your web browser and server to communicate effectively. So we'll say that that is the header information, the HTTP header in that case. We don't need to understand what all of that means. It's just some extra information used by the protocol. In addition, if we minimize that, all of that HTTP message is put inside a TCP segment. HTTP is the application layer protocol. What we did is that we had some data. The application layer protocol put that inside a HTTP message and to send that delivers it to the transport layer. The protocol used at the transport layer is TCP in this instance. TCP follows its rules. It's a protocol for trying to deliver data reliably to the other side and puts the HTTP message inside a TCP segment. That is, it adds a header, some extra bytes, which are used by TCP to communicate with the other side. And we see what that includes here. One thing we recognize, the TCP header includes the source port number. Which application did it come from? Okay, it came from a web server. And the destination port number, which application is it going to? And this would be the port number of my web browser on my laptop. And some other useful information for TCP. TCP creates this TCP packet or segment sends it to the network layer to deliver. And at the network layer, we're running IP. And IP takes all of this and puts it in an IP datagram, attaches a header, and the header includes the version of the protocol we're using, version 4, the length of the header, some different information, things we recognize, the source IP address, where it came from, and the destination IP address. Because what's happening is that the, the server here is sending this packet. The destination is set to 10.10.3.2.3.9. It sends it out to the network, and it's the role of the network to deliver that to the computer with that address here. So we need the destination address in there. So that's the IP header. And then the network layer delivers that to the data link layer.
actually we don't know at the server the network layer delivers it to the data link layer we don't know what it is it's sent across the network when it arrives at my computer my laptop it's received from some other device here and the data link layer used over this link is Ethernet because we see here the packet or the header format is Ethernet so in fact we have an Ethernet header that contains the hardware address of the source and destination that is the hardware address of this device the source and the hardware address of my computer the destination because the packet arrived here and was sent onto my computer and that's the structure of the packet received by my computer and captured by this program Any questions on that program before we move back to the slides? Yep. It's quite off topic, but in the hypertext transfer protocol, why mm -hmm. HTTP has to be split by backslash R and backslash A? In HTTP, we see. So HTTP is split by backslash R and backslash N? Backslash why N is. Why we can't use just backslash N? I think. It's, it's to do with how do you end a line in different operating systems. I think in Windows and in Unix systems they are different characters to end a line. There's a, uh, and it all comes from old computers where you press enter, that what slash n means a new line and slash r I think means return. Like you return and then go to the new line. Return to the end, go to the new line. Uh, it's just a way to represent in simplest form a new line it's different I can't remember the, which one is which it's different in Unix systems and in Windows systems and the standard for HTTP obviously uses this format it's chosen that format any other questions on this packet capture you don't have to understand how the program works just the main point here, here is that we saw two packets and we looked at the packet that my computer sent from the web browser and received from the web server and the structure is that we have the data and the protocols at each of the layers have attached some header some extra information that is used by that protocol to communicate so in fact this was the data sent by the server this was the entire packet received by my computer we would say all of this is some overhead we can't avoid it it's part of how the protocols work but from the user's perspective all I wanted to do was see a web page receive this data the real data but for the protocols to work effectively they added all these headers which from the user's perspective is, is some overhead we cannot remove this overhead because we need it for the protocols to work but we'd like it to be as small as possible let's summarize that by returning to the slides that's sort of illustrated here what the web server did it took the data which is the HTML page put it inside a application message that is add, added the HTTP header that was sent to the transport layer TCP was operating it follows its rules and one thing it does is puts it inside a TCP segment attaches the TCP header sends all of that to the network layer remember this is all inside one computer when I say send send from the transport layer to the network layer 
or send from TCP to IP, it's just communicating between software on that one computer. Interprocess communication. So it's just inside memory inside that computer is the sending. Sent to the network layer, we have an IP datagram, includes the source and destination IP addresses. Sent to the data link layer, it turns out the Ethernet adds a header. It also adds something at the end, a trailer. In this case, a checksum to check that there are no bit errors inside the data. That is sent to the physical layer, the Ethernet frame sent to the physical layer. Remember the role of the physical layer is to take a sequence of bits, it just treats it as bits. It doesn't care whether it's a HTTP message, IP, it's just a sequence of bits. And the physical layer transmits those bits across the link. And this example, say, is some electrical signal, some waveform representing the, the signal being sent where the signal represents the sequence of bits. How do we map bits into some signal? Well, we have some topics on that to look at different ways. One way may be to change the phase of the signal being sent. Use one phase for bit one, a different phase for bit zero. Or another case, change the amplitude of the signal. signal. Have a high amplitude signal if we're transmitting a bit one, have a low amplitude signal if transmitting a bit zero. We'll see that in more detail. So that's how the data is encapsulated inside packets through the TCP IP stack. It is sent, if this happened at our server, the signal is sent from the server across the link our network may contain other devices. The network may be a set of devices linked together. This device receives the signal, works out what the sequence of bits were, gets the Ethernet frame, the IP datagram, and then sends it on to the next device, which receives it, sends it to the next device, until my laptop receives this, it receives some signal, converts it back to bits, sends those bits to the data link layer, Ethernet goes to work, checks that what was received is correct, there's no bit errors in there, if everything's okay, Ethernet at the data link layer removes the header and trailer, sends what's inside up to the network layer. We take this and deliver it to the IP. IP looks at the header, check if everything's okay. It checks. The destination address matches my address, which means that this data is destined to me. Therefore, it removes the header, sends the what's inside to the next layer. TCP checks what was received, have there been any errors, it, it's more complex than what we show here, it does many checks to, and may have to retransmit. If everything's okay, TCP removes the header, takes what's inside, sends it to the application layer, HTTP eventually will remove the header and send the data to the application. In this case, the HTML is delivered and used by the web browser and then displayed on the web browser to mark up the page. So the transmitter, we can think of going in this direction of creating the signal. The receiving computer receives some signal and goes in this direction of eventually delivering the original data to the application and the end user. When we look at individual protocols, we'll see how they communicate between the layers in more detail. What is, what is TCP actually doing? We haven't really said what it does. We just said it adds a header, sends the IP. We need a whole two or three lectures to say what it does.
All right, let's finish on layers and protocol architectures and then look at some final thing about how to measure performance in a network. But first, where is all of this implemented? The entire stack is in my laptop. Where in my laptop? Well, a general way to split up the layers would be to say the application layer protocols are implemented in applications running on my computer. My web browser, my instant messaging client. Either the application implements it or possibly there's a library that implements it. The transport layer and network layer are implemented as software normally in your OS, in your operating system. So if you look at the source code of your Linux operating system, then you'll find in there there's some, some files that implement TCP and IP and the other protocols. So they are part of the operating system because they are used by many different applications. Your web browser uses TCP. Your instant messaging client uses TCP. Even Skype uses TCP. So instead of each application implementing the protocol on its own, it's implemented by the operating system. And generally we can say the rest, the data link layer and physical layer, are implemented in your network interface card. All right, that may be inside your laptop or on board your, your motherboard, but it's a, a chip or a set of chips that implement the data link layer and physical layer. How to take a sequence of bits and transmit them across a link in the hardware. So that finishes, finishes us on protocol architectures. What we're going to do shortly or next lecture is start going through the physical layer up. But first, let's say something about how we can measure the performance of internet applications. What do we care about, especially with regards to performance? What's an internet application? Well, we could say a standalone application is some piece of software that has some user interface and some code that implements the application logic. If it's your Photoshop, it just runs on your computer. It operates just on your computer. It doesn't need to run and communicate with other computers. It's a standalone application which has some user interface, the buttons you can click, and some code that implements all the operations that you do with Photoshop. An internet application or a network application has a user interface, like your web browser has the buttons you can click on, has some application logic. For example, your web browser has some code that takes the HTML, parses, parses that HTML to produce something to be displayed on the screen. But it also has communication mechanisms. Your web browser has some code that allows it to communicate with a web server. So we can say the difference between a standalone and a network-based application is that the network application includes communication mechanisms to communicate with other instances of applications. And the application has its full functionality when it communicates with others. You've used internet applications, you know plenty of examples we could broadly classify them as, say, the traditional data-based applications, the ones which are sending data across a network, and multimedia or real-time applications, when we're usually sending, well, sometimes normal data, but often we care about sending voice and video. Downloading files, BitTorrent, sending emails, web browsing, Logging, in, logging into other computers, instant messaging, accessing databases, let's say a traditional internet-based applications. In all of those applications, if one computer sends data to another, we usually want that data to be delivered with 100% accuracy. If we are downloading a file, a one megabyte file, then the file that is sent and the file that is received, they should be identical. 
It's no good if someone sends me a file and what's received, I only received, I don't know, I only received 900,000 bytes rather than one megabyte. Or I receive one megabyte but the bits are wrong. There are errors in that file. I need 100% accuracy for me to open that file and use it. So accuracy is perhaps the most important for these applications. Audio and video streaming, watching a YouTube video, listening to a radio on the internet, making voice calls, video calls, gaming, collaborative applications like sharing desktops, interacting with desktops with different people. These applications we generally think timeliness is most important. Remember our three measures of effectiveness? Delivery. We want to make sure that the data is delivered to the correct destination. That applies for both set. Accuracy. Make sure that data is delivered 100% accurate. That's more important with these applications. Timeliness. Make sure the data is delivered within some reasonable time. That's more important here. When you make a voice call, you're talking to someone. Using Skype, for example, you talk into your microphone, eventually your computer creates bits out of your voice and sends those bits across the internet to the destination and the computer at the person you're talking with takes those bits and creates some audio and plays it on the speakers. The time from when you speak, when you say a word, the computer generates all that, sends across the internet, received and then played on the speakers, should be less than one second. If the delay from when you talk to when they hear you talk is more than a second, then it starts to ha be hard to have a conversation. If it's 10 seconds, then one person talks, takes 10 seconds for what they say to get there, in the meantime, the other person has started to talk and they start to interfere with each other or overlap in talking. If you talk on a phone and there's a large delay between the two people talking, you will not be able to converse. Timeliness is very important for that application. In fact, normally we care about delivering the data in a matter of tens of or possibly hundreds of milliseconds. Same with streaming video. Okay, you start your YouTube video, you press play. You may wait several seconds for it to start. That may be okay. But once it's started, you want to be able to have smooth playback of that video. You don't want it to stop and start every two seconds. For that to work, normally the packets which are coming from the YouTube server, which contain the video, need to arrive at your computer within some reasonable time without too much variance in delay so that your computer can play back the video clearly. So timeliness is perhaps most important for these applications. I send an email and it takes one hour to get to the destination, I will survive with that. But if I send, if I'm gaming and it takes 10 seconds for my commands to reach the server and back, then the game will not work because I'll shoot someone and the other people will not know until 10 seconds later. You need a response time or fast response time for that application to work. Of course we care about timeliness for these applications but not as much as these. And of course we care about accuracy for these applications but not as much. And not as much means that in some cases the accuracy doesn't have to be 100%. You're streaming video again from the YouTube server to your computer. The YouTube server is sending you video. So it takes the frames of the video and sends them in packets to your computer over the internet. But some of the packets don't arrive. What does that mean at your computer? It means that maybe you're watching a video, one frame is not displayed on your screen. Now frames in video are normally displayed about 25 frames per second. So you're receiving data and your computer is showing a picture 25 times per second. If you don't see one of them, the video still looks okay. You'll still watch the video and be able to see what's happening. If you don't receive 100 frames, that's a problem. 
but if we lose some data, the application still works. So even if we don't have 100% accuracy, these applications can still work. Here we need 100% accuracy. So that's some difference between those applications. We care about performance. We've got two more slides for today and then some examples. How can we measure the performance of a communication system or a communications network? We'll mention three, four main metrics, four main ways we measure performance. Because we want to evaluate and choose the right technology. You go out and get a job after you graduate and you're employed to advise people on what network technology to deploy for their new network. Well, you need to make a judgement. And one way to make a judgement is to choose technologies is based upon these performance metrics. The other thing is cost, of course. The first one, bandwidth, is about the set of frequencies that are sent between transmitter and receiver across a particular link. We're not going to say anything about that because we need to explain how we transmit signals in the next topic. Let's skip over that one and look at something that we can explain that you do know about. Another one, so we'll return to bandwidth in the next topic. Another one is data rate. We measure the we care about how fast we can send data across a link. The bandwidth is about the physical signals that can be sent across a link, because if we send electrical signals, they have some frequency. Some technologies only allow a certain bandwidth, a certain set of frequencies. But we'll cover that later. The other thing we care about is, and it's related, is how many bits can we send across a particular link or network. I buy a technology, we use it for communicating between computers, how fast can I send data across that link using that technology? How many bits per second can I send? We refer to that as the data rate or the bit rate or in some cases the capacity. The maximum speed at which we can send data across some link. An example, if it's working, still 10 minutes to go, you'll get there. My wireless LAN interface. So I can connect from my laptop to there's an access point out in the corridor just outside this room. So I send signals between the two. Those signals have some, or there's some bandwidth of signals that I can transmit. That depends upon my wireless LAN device. I'm using 802.11G. It can send signals at a particular bandwidth. And at a particular bit rate or data rate. I can send data at some maximum speed and right now the maximum speed is 1 million bits per second. That is the data rate of my wireless LAN link. I can't send any faster to the access point. If I plug, or this computer is plugged into this wired LAN, has an Ethernet cable, connects to some device downstairs, that can possibly send at 100 million bits per second, 100 megabits per second. It's a different technology and it has a different data rate. I'm limited to 1 megabit per second. Maybe with wired I can go 100 megabits per second or even 1 gigabit per second, depending on how much I paid for the computer. That's the data rate, the maximum speed you can send across that link. You'll notice with wireless LAN the data rate or the bit rate may go up and down. If I have a good quality link, this may jump to 
11 megabits per second or even 54 megabits per second. But at this point in time, I have a low quality link. It's limited to one megabit per second. For our internet applications, we generally want a higher data rate. We'd like to transfer our data faster with smaller delay. So we generally like higher data rate. So my wireless LAN had a data rate of one megabit per second. That's the maximum capacity of that link, or in generally we can say also a network. But if I send data across that using my web browser or another application, I may not be able to download at one megabit per second. It may be less, or it will be less usually. When we want to measure how much real data we can send across a link, or a network, we consider that a throughput. What's the speed at which real useful data can be successfully delivered across a link or a network? And again, that's measured in bits per second. If I have a data rate of one megabit per second, I may have a throughput of less than one megabit per second because one reason there are overheads. The overheads take away from the data rate for delivering the real data. What's the speed that we can send real data across a link or a network is a measure of throughput. Here's a test and we'll see if it works. My data rate of my link is one megabit per second. Let's see if I can download a file and see how long it takes. Maybe not. It's all right. Try again. Wrong address. I'm downloading a large file, 10 megabytes. This is the speed it's downloading at. So it's around 200, it's going up to 250, 280, 300. What's wrong? So not, that's just the average speed at the end it will report the average over time. Uh, average 222 kilobytes per second. Note my data rate. It was at 11 megabits per second. Before it was one, but when I started to transfer data, it went up to 11 megabits per second. So that's what was wrong. Ignore one megabit per second. My data rate was 11 megabits per second. Let's 11 megabits per second data rate. When I, my application downloaded that file, it report, reported the throughput, the speed at which I could download or receive that data. If 
first, let's note some units that we're using here. B, lowercase b, we'll use to refer to bits. Uppercase b, bytes. There's a difference there. So 222, right, and what else? M, mega, K, kilo, and these refer to 1,000, and of course 1 million, or 10 to the power of 6. So what do we have? 11 million bits per second is the data rate of my link. The throughput for transferring that file times by 8, and what do we get? Okay, that'll do. Times by 8, we get approximately this kilobits per second, which is about 1.7 megabit per second. Data rate 11 megabits per second, throughput 1.7 megabits per second. So even though we can transmit bits at this speed, 11 million per second, in terms of real data, in this case the file that I downloaded, we could only transfer 1.7 million bits per second of real data. Where's the rest gone? Well, one thing is overheads. All these headers that we need to transmit don't contribute to the throughput. They are overheads. It's only the real data that we're counting that we're receiving. Yeah, the throughput counts is the speed at which we receive the real useful data. So from, it depends on whose perspective we look at it. If I look at it from the perspective of me, the human user, yeah, it, the, it measures just the file that I requested. All the headers that are attached by the protocols, I don't care about them. I don't want to download them. I cannot avoid them. I want to know how fast can I download the file. In this case, it was 1.7 megabit per second. So throughput is always less than the data rate because we have overheads. There may have been retransmissions. The server sent me part of the file. I recognised some error. It had to send again. So it takes time to transmit the data and hence the throughput can be much less. So yeah, uppercase B, bytes, lowercase B, bits. Be careful with the difference there. There's a document, I think, in your handouts which has a list of the different uh, units and so on that we use. Worth checking. Eight bits per byte. And kilo means 1,000, not 1,024, not the binary form, the decimal form, 1,000. Makes life easier. So... We really care about throughput. But in some systems, it's hard to know what the throughput will be. If I downloaded that file again, it may be 2 megabits per second or 1 megabit per second. So the throughput may change over time. The data rate still may be 11 megabits per second. The data rate is a characteristic of the technology. I buy a wireless LAN card, I know what the data rates may be. If I download a large file as opposed to download a web page, the throughput may change. So we care about both of them. Data rate characteristic of a technology, usually known. Throughput in some cases can be calculated, but in some cases it varies, so it may not be known. You buy a wireless LAN card, the marketing material says data rate 54 megabits per second or 108 megabits per second. But when you download a file using that wireless LAN device, your throughput may be much or will be much less. 
and that's what we really care about throughput. The last metric that we'll cover and we won't cover in detail today, delay. How long does it take for the data to get from source to destination? Measured in seconds. We'll see that there are different components that contribute to delay. Transmission, propagation, processing and queuing. Let's cover them tomorrow. So let's finish there. What we'll do tomorrow is we'll go explain delay and then we'll go through several examples illustrating throughput, delay and other metrics. <laughs>